Uh, today, talk and poetry reading is about um, Latin American poetry in the U.S. And I ha first, I have to say thank you. It is, it is really a treat to be here uh, by the invitation of, of Raul. Um, I, I do have memories of wanting to be a poet uh, before I actually knew what that meant. Um, those, it is the kind of certainty that comes not from the mind, but from somewhere in between the heart and the blood. It just happens. You realize what you are, and then you pursue yourself until you become what you think you are. And this pursuing of self is pretty much what I'm going to be talking about today. Being a Latin American poet in the U.S., and especially in the U.S. right now with this uh, political environment, um, with the really agitated uh, political times that we're living right now, where, where being Latin American is difficult, and being a poet has always been difficult, and now being both at the same time is not particularly the most fun or profitable things to be. Um, but n nonetheless, we exist. And the only reason that we exist is because we cannot stop being what we are. You know, a Latin American poet in China is a Latin American poet. And a Latin American poet in Latin America is a Latin American poet. So you, it is just about not being able and not wanting either to stop being what you are. Yet, there is uh, the problem with the definition. What does it mean to be a Latin American poet? And what does it mean to be that in the US? The first thing that I want to say is that um, yes, I have a PhD, and yes, I studied my bachelor's and master's and PhD in literature. I do know theory, and, and my, my, my dissertation used heavy, heavily Bourdieu and stuff like that, but I am speaking today as a poet, which means that I'm expressing a lot of things that I know because of poetry which is a beautiful way to say that I don't know things. In the center of the poem, there is always a question, not a certainty. Certainty is, 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 is a matter of religion, when you know things. But poetry is closer to silence. It's a pregnant silence. So I am today talking as a poet, <coughs> and of course as a human being, and as a Latin American man in the US. So I am talking about my experience, and the experience of those who are close to me, and those things that I have seen. The first problem when talking about Latin American poetry is precisely defining what is Latin American poetry in the US. Is Latin American poetry the poetry written by Latin American poets based in Latin America that is being read in the US? <coughs> or is it Latin American poetry, the US? The one written by Latin American poets based in the US that are not very much read in Latin America. There are different literary fields. In the case of Mexico, for example, which is the country that I was born in. Mexico has, and this is known, a hyper-institutionalized cultural life. The state, the Mexican state, the government, pays for a lot of publications, a lot of scholarships. Um, it, is, it, is, it can be, which is funny, in a country like Mexico, it can be profitable to be an author. You can, you, can, you can have this scholarship, and that scholarship, and this award, and that award. And, award, and, and poetry awards are awards of $10,000, $50,000, $30,000. It's a lot of money there. But you pretty much need to be there to be part of that circuit. So writing from the outside and calling yourself part of Mexican literature is, 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 is tricky. Yet it happens. Uh, if we think about Valeria Luiselli, for example, she is a, an author living in the United States. 
we can have our distance. Now that she's talking about the immigrant children and all of that. She was sitting in the knees of Nelson Mandela when she was a baby. She is a hyper-privileged Mexican. Um, I don't know how close she is to the subject of the things that she's talking about. But she uses her uh, nationality as part of her, um, of her authority. We can discuss those things later. But what I mean is that writing from here and writing from there necessarily mean different things. And this is not necessarily that one is better than the other, but is that they, the channels from which poetry reaches the audience and the audience that you reach are different. A Latin American poet, and, and this is not something new, Jose Martí was publishing in New York and writing in New York and, and, and uh, influential poets like, I don't know, Oscar Hahn or Pedro Lastra or Rojas Antibáñez are writing from the United States, right? However, the idea of what Latin America means seen from the United States and seen from the Latin American countries is necessarily different for one big and, and maybe obvious reason. When I was in Mexico, when I lived in Mexico, I was very worried about Mexican poetry. And I was reading other Mexican poets, and I walked outside and saw my friends, they were Mexican <coughs> poets, and, and I was aware of what was going on in the Mexican circuit. When I got to the United States, my friends, my poet friends, were not all Mexican. <coughs> we're from all Latin America. So necessarily, when we went to the bar, sometimes poets drink. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. But when we went to the bar, or when we were in a house, or when we, when we, when we were together, we necessarily talked about Latin American poetry. Because each one of us was talking about their, his own country. Then we were comparing. And at the end, we, this group of people, became our own community. But our own community was not national. We were close because we were all Hispanic and we were close because we were all writing in Spanish. But it was not anymore about just your country. The Latin American poet in the US has to be Latin American. You can only be a Mexican poet when you're there in Mexico, and when you're surrounded by others. When, you, when we get here, there, there has to be this change of gear, which also happens, and, and for those that have been in this country for long, you, 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 you will t attest what I'm saying is, it also happens with, with, with the language itself. We start adopting little words from our friend, the Puerto Rican, and, and, and little words from our friend, the, the Colombian, and little words from our friend, the Dominican, because that is our community. We don't often put all of those forms of Spanish in our poems, but they are in our life, and they are in our way of seeing the world. So the poetry that is written from uh, by poets that live in the United States and that write in Spanish and that were born in Latin American countries is uh, poetry that sees their countries, but they see their countries in the context of Latin America. They, we obviously see our countries from outside in and not from inside out. We are also often comparing our own culture and poetry with the one of the country that we live in. Because now many, for example, in my case, many of my poet friends don't speak Spanish. Um, for a very long time, for a very long time, I live in the United States and I have friends that knew that I was a poet, but I didn't have any proof because I didn't have any poem translated into English. So my friends that like literature knew that there was a guy that liked, he's always talking about poetry, but they were never able to read my stuff. Until two hours, until two hours, until two years ago, when I started translating my own poetry into English, and then I started existing in this other circle, where now, when I think about my poetic endeavors, I have to think dually, 
It's like what I'm doing in the United States, where it's always a combination of English and Spanish, side by side, especially when I publish, and what is happening in Mexico or Latin America. And the styles of poetry are different. My American friends are more interested in this narrative poetry that is looking for an epiphany at the end of the poem. They are uh, more interested in, 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 in kinds of poetry that are not exactly what is, what are going, on, what is going on in different countries of, of Latin America. And I have to be able to appreciate both to exist here. So I do believe that existing as a Latin American poet in the US is a matter of, of identity. The first question is, who are you writing for? The right question is, nobody. You're writing for yourself. You're writing for the poem. right? But then, after the poem is written, where are you going to publish it? What are you going to put it? How are you going to present it? Are you going to publish it in English first? Are you going to publish it in Spanish first? All of these practical things are part of the life of the Latin American poet living in the, in the US. I have, and here, everyone takes a decision. I have, for example, a, a, a dear friend and, and, and a mentor in Cincinnati, the Colombian poet Armando Romero. Highly prestigious Colombian poet that has no publications in the US. Translated to several, several European languages. But he never made of the US, of the country where he has been living for 40 years, his place of existence. And this has happened with many poets. Think about Jose Emilio Pacheco, for example. Jose Emilio Pacheco was in the University of Maryland at least once a year for a very long time, a very, very prestigious uh, position there. Um, but he won the Premio Cervantes, but he rarely cared about doing things in English outside of the Spanish department of such and such university, which are like little embassies of the countries, right? Um, going to, to these pockets of the university is not really getting to the country. It's getting to the, to the people like you in these little pockets. Is this making sense? But there are other. I think that there is also a generational thing. There are other poets that are deciding to pursue two things. Um, because Maybe we got here younger or so. I, I, what I'm trying to say is that the identity of the Latin American poet in the US is fluid and it is changing. And uh, that right now, because of the political environment that we are in, is not even protesting is less necessary. Of course, what I'm, what I'm saying is scandalous because everything that, is being, everything that is happening right now is to protest. But the act of existing is a protest in itself. Because sometimes there is this push against the language itself. It is very hard to hear in the news virtually every day that someone was attacked at Walmart for speaking Spanish to his son or daughter. And then you decide to make your language the core of your life. Because a poet is nothing but a messenger of the language itself. Yet, poetry happens. And I think that there is, there is a huge um, dilemma for the Latin American poet in the US, which is to become only a poet that talks about being Latin American. That has been, for me, a huge problem. You get to a university 
you get to a point you're reading. And you want to read a poem about, I don't know, silence or snow, something. But what is being asked is, how is it to be a Latin American poet? How is it to be brown here? How is it, like, those were never going to be my subjects if I stay there. I became a Mexican poet when I got off the plane from Mexico here. Because obviously in Mexico, nobody introduced me saying the Mexican poet, because everybody was a Mexican poet. Being Mexican was not special. But here, before someone said the poet, there is always that adjective. Like being a poet is not special enough. You are the Mexican poet. And I have every problem with that. I mean, I'm not denying that I'm, I am a Mexican poet. But I, I do believe that what defines me ontologically first is to be a poet. If there was a God, the day that he was making me, he said, we're going to make a poet. And then she decided everything else. Is this making sense? What defines me in the universe is the fact that I am a poet, not the fact that I am Mexican. Because if I wasn't Mexican, I would be a poet too. And if I wasn't male, I would be a poet too. And if I was taller or shorter, or if I was not this handsome, I would be a poet too. That is what I believe defines me. And that is what I want my poems to say. But there is, there is this editorial, there is this publishing house page that exists here. That is the one subject that everybody is expecting you to talk about. And sometimes, the worst part is that that is the only way that is going to be profitable to write. That is the only way that someone is going to look, and you're going to get invited to things. I'm going to read several poems today. Some of them talk about immigration. Some of them talk about my situation as an immigrant. Most of them don't. And here is what I, what I, what I care about this talk today. What I mean to say is that a Latin American poet in the US is a poet. And we have to conquer our right to be a poet before anything else. If we let ourselves be defined by the fact that we are Latin American and then that we're poets, we are letting someone else define our poetry and ourselves. I am a poet and I have the right to talk about anything, including my identity, but also to not talk about that. Because you will see. The first poem is called Arte Poetica. And Ars Poetica, as you guys know, is a poem about poetry. Horace started the great Ars Poeticas. This is a Cincinnati poem. Why is this a Cincinnati poem? Because I am from the Yucatan. In the Yucatan, there are no seasons. It's just hot all year. Okay? We have the, the, the Spanish word for season is estacion, um, which is the same word for uh, station, like a bus station. So people make the joke that there are two estaciones in Merida. Uh, summer and the bus station. That's it. <laughs> But this is a poem about fall, autumn. Autumn only exists to me after my arrival to Cincinnati. This poem would have been impossible to think of. This situation would have been impossible to think of in Merida. So I owe to my Cincinnati experience this very short poem, Ars Poetica. Stubborn, the yellow leaf does not let go of the branch. I watch her battle against wind and rain, against gravity. 
For days I've been watching her quiet effort, her tiny tragedy. Her persistence does not deserve oblivion. That is why I put her here in this verse from which she will not fall. Arte poética. Terca, la hoja amarilla no se suelta de la rama. La observo en su disputa contra el viento y la lluvia, contra la gravedad. Llevo días mirando su callado esfuerzo, su tragedia diminuta. Su persistencia no merece olvido. Es por eso que la he puesto aquí, en este verso, el que no caerá. Is this poem talking about my Mexicanity? No, it is not. <coughs> Because I am also a person that worries about time. And I have the right to worry about time. And I have the right to worry about death and about love and about all of the other things. Because the fact that I was born somewhere else is not the only thing that I'm condemned to talk about. I can if I want. I can if I need to, but I can also write a poem about a leaf. Because that is not, not only Robert Frost can talk about trees. So a Latin American poet in the US is a poet because a Latin American human being in the US is a human. And I believe that even when we are celebrating differences, even if we are celebrating them, we are focusing on the differences. And we should stop for a little bit in, in literature and in society in general to focus on the differences. Because a man that worries about time is just a man. And he should be loved and respected, not because he is different, but because he's the same. So these poems that are non-political are, to me at least, a political stand. This is the conquer of my creative freedom. I am going to write about whatever I need to write about. Because I have several, like any other human, several human conflicts and they are all going to find their way into the poems. When I say this, I'm also talking about the matter of identity. Can you find a poem called, I am from here? When I'm talking about the matter of identity, one of the poems that I have been reading a lot is one called, I am from here. In, in, Cincinnati, Kentucky, the poet laureate of the state of Kentucky, George Ella Lyon, wrote a poem called I Am From Here, which is I am from here, and then, then she said, instead of a place, she said emotions and memories, and etc. Can you imagine? You can imagine how the poem goes. And that became a really good writing prompt. And I, I teach creative writing with my students, and I gave them the writing prompt. And one day, one of my students told me, why don't you write an I Am From poem? And they were right. And I found myself in a, in, a, in, a, in a conflict because I already live in Cincinnati. I got married there. My, my, my daughter was born there. When I go back to Mexico, now I miss my friends in Cincinnati and I miss drinking bourbon in the evenings. But when I am in Cincinnati, I miss listening Spanish talk in the streets. And, and, and what I miss most of everything is not being different. I miss, to, I miss not standing out. So I wrote this poem, which I think can talk about the experience of the kind of Latin American poet that I am. Because I am not, I, 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 I live close, I, I, I have students whose parents have been deported. I have students that were in danger of being deported themselves. But that was not my story. I got to the United States to study literature. I was at the I had students. I gave grades to people. It's a very different situation. And I can go back and forth. I go and visit my family and I come. 
I'm not saying that it's ideal. I'm not saying that it doesn't hurt. But I'm not going to claim those stories as mine. So I wrote this poem called I Am From Here, talking about being the kind of immigrant that I am, which is the kind of immigrant that has two houses. Oh, and, now, and now I want to say something else. There are, different, there are different ways of thinking about being a Latin American writer in the US. I have a very dear friend in Chicago, um, Fernando Slansky. And he, he always talks about literatura del desarraigo. You know, this, this, uh, the Latin American writers are, are not grounded in the United States, and they are always longing for that place. And, and there is this very nostalgic and, 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 and painful way of understanding your identity here. That is not my case. I am not a writer that feels that has no home, because I am not in that home, and this is never going to be my. I, 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 I like my situation. I, 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 I feel I have two homes, and I'm always missing one, which sucks, but I have two. I love going back to Mexico, but when I'm there, I miss my Cincinnati. And I love being in Cincinnati, but I will always miss Mexico. And the problem is that I cannot be in both places at the same time, but I don't feel that I have no home. I feel that I will never be fully complete, but because I have two homes. So it's a good problem to have. I am from here. One is from the places that he has arrived, from the language in which he can't dream, and one day it happens and he wakes up wondering which one is now his house when there is always a heart elsewhere. One comes from the streets that never are the same when he returns. One comes from the moment in which he decided to leave and from that other one in which he realizes that everything departs, that it's impossible to stay even if you stay, that it's impossible even if you go back to be back. I write a verse that is like a farewell and point at it. I am from here. Soy de aquí. Uno es de los sitios a los que ha llegado, del idioma en el que no puede soñar y un día sucede y se despierta preguntándose cuál es su casa ahora cuando siempre hay corazón en otra parte. Uno proviene de las calles que ya nunca son las mismas al volver. Proviene del momento en el que decidió partir y de ese otro en el que entiende que todo se aleja que es imposible quedarse aunque te quedes, que es imposible aunque regreses, regresar. Escribo un verso que es como una despedida y lo señalo. Soy de aquí. Here. Writing these two verses represents a change in my life and in poetry. I always longed to go back. So I was one of those Latin American poets in the US that are thinking that it's just, this is just momentary. I'm going to be here, and then I'm going to go back. So I didn't care much about life here. Then I met my wife. Then I realized I was not coming back. Then I went back for vacation several times. And then I realized that, that the streets were not the same. My friend's life changed. Some of them were not in the city. My house looked different. I was always thinking about going back to a place, but I realized that I was always longing to go back to a moment. And that was impossible, per se. At some point, I realized that it was impossible to go back, even if I went back. That day, I think I became more free, because I stopped thinking about going back, because I realized that it was impossible to go back, even if I took the plane. That realization made it possible to me embrace what I did have here, because I realized that I was surrounded by present, and I could either waste it or take it, and I decided to take it. 
but this was not a realization. What I'm, what I'm telling you right now was not was not a result of thinking. I wrote the verses first, and then I knew. However, life happens, and being here, the experience of the immigrant sometimes is. It reveals you that even grief is taken differently. Can you find a poem called Elegía y Bienvenida para mi Padre? This was also a poem that I was afraid to write. I was afraid of this possible moment. For those that live here with family somewhere else, know that there is something that you, that, you, that you are always thinking. It may happen. In my case, it was the death of my father. I knew that he was going to die there. I, I, I was, for years, scared of that phone call. And I was not going to be there. And because of circumstances that, it, that don't matter right now to explain, I couldn't attend to the funeral of my father two years ago. And I think that that is part of the immigrant experience. However, what I didn't imagine is that because I am an immigrant, um, his passing was a way to get closer. Because now I can think that he's here with me instead of always there in that house. Elegy and welcome to my father, whose funeral I could not attend. He has a little epigraph, a Seamus Heaney, that says, Dangerous pavements, but I face the eyes this year with my father's stick. I was always afraid to write, I woke up today, father, in a world where you no longer exist. But it turns out that sometimes death is the consolation of immigrants. Today we beat the phone calls and the airports. Today you enter my house. Perhaps that's why I'm scared of going back, of watching the afternoon without you there. I don't want to see your grave. I don't want you to have a grave, but I will go. I'm going to look at it, and then I will keep talking to you. Now as I write, I am again the boy who raises his hand seeking for yours. Father, this morning you did not wake up and I do not say goodbye. Today you enter my house. Elegía y bienvenida para mi padre a cuyo entierro no pude acudir. Siempre tuve miedo de escribir. Hoy desperté, papá, en un mundo en el que ya no existes. Pero resulta que a veces la muerte es el consuelo de los inmigrantes. Hoy superamos el teléfono y los aeropuertos. Hoy entras a mi casa. Quizá por eso tengo miedo de volver, de ver la tarde sin que tú la ocupes. No quiero ver tu tumba. No quiero que tengas una tumba. Pero voy a ir. Voy a mirarla y después voy a seguir hablando contigo. Ahora que escribo, soy de nuevo el niño que levanta su mano buscando la tuya. Papá, esta mañana no te despertaste y yo no me despido. Hoy entras a mi casa. Because life is the way it is. The same year that my father died, my daughter was born. And then there was a different experience of the immigrant, which I also didn't anticipate happening to me. But I, I got a little scared. I still am. <laughs> Look for the language of the house. About which language was Olivia? Olivia that's, is her name. Which language was she going to? Speak first, because there are two languages, right? 
from the door in, we speak Spanish. And from the door out, it's all completely in English. She's starting to speak right now. She's about to be two years old. So I wrote this poem called The Language of the House, which I think that is a, po it's a poem about parenting. And it, is, and it is a poem about being an immigrant father. I'm going to read two poems about my daughter, this and then the next one. And I will close this talk. The language of the house. Sometimes I am afraid that you will talk in the language in which I cannot dream. I almost always wish that you live first the language of the house, the one in which I lull you to sleep in which I imagined you telling me your things. You still do not know that there is a different music outside. Lately, I have been afraid of the months because you were born here, in this place, in this language in which I am a foreigner. And I want to live in your world, in the language that you will have within your words. I am afraid that you will also know the impossibility of belonging that you will build your own homeland like anyone else. If someone asks you where are you from, tell them that you came from your father's heart, a heart that will learn any language to talk to you. El idioma de la casa. A veces tengo miedo de que hables el idioma en el que no puedo soñar. Casi siempre deseo que primero vivas el idioma de la casa el mismo en que te arrullo, en el que te imagino platicándome tus cosas. Todavía no distingues que afuera hay otra música. Últimamente tengo miedo de los meses porque tú has nacido aquí, en este sitio, en este idioma en el que soy un extranjero. Y yo quiero vivir dentro de tu mundo, del idioma que tendrás, de tus palabras. Me da miedo que conozcas la imposibilidad de pertenecer pero te harás tu patria, como cualquiera. Si te preguntan de dónde eres, diles que has venido del corazón de tu padre, de un corazón que aprendería cualquier idioma para hablar contigo. It is a poem from the perspective of an immigrant. But it is a poem from the perspective of a parent. Because an immigrant parent is a parent. And I want to make very clear in my poems that before <coughs> being a Latin American poet, I am a poet. And before being a Latin American human, I'm a human. And that is what we should point out with every human being of every kind of diversity. I believe in celebrating diversity. I believe in celebrating the differences, but I don't believe in celebrating them so much that that's all we see. There is a mistake when we highlight them so much. This last poem is another poem for my daughter. And I'm not going to introduce the poem. I'm just going to read it, and then we can talk about what it is. Letter, this, I wrote this one before the other one. Letter to my newborn daughter to help her christen the world. Now that the world is brand new, I want to go out to the balcony with you and tell you this is a tree, this is a leaf, and that jumping on that branch is a fruit, a bird, a flower, is the song of the bird, it is the air. But someday you are going to ask me of love and war, of hope and death, of why we came to be born precisely now, precisely here, and those answers I also ignore. Instead, I offer you my little certainties. Everything is in sight if you pay attention to little things. There is more truth in an embrace than in a book. 
Everything in the world is dark and vital, like a root, beautiful and destructive, like a wildfire. You must live without fearing death, your own or others. We needed to return to the beginning. Now that the world is completely new, I give you also these two amulets so, we, so you can save them or wear them in your hair. Silence is music. I love you. Carta a mi hija recién nacida para ayudarla a inaugurar el mundo, como dice el gaviero. Ahora que el mundo es completamente nuevo, quiero salir contigo al balcón y decirte, esto es un árbol, esto una hoja, y eso que brinca encima de esa rama es una fruta, un pájaro, una flor, es la canción del pájaro, es el aire. Pero algún día vas a preguntarme del amor y la guerra, la esperanza y la muerte, del por qué venimos a nacer precisamente ahora, precisamente aquí, y esas respuestas yo también las desconozco. En su lugar te ofrezco mis pequeñas certezas. Todo está a la vista si prestas atención a las cosas pequeñas. Hay más verdad en un abrazo que en un libro. Todo en el mundo es oscuro y vital como raíz, hermoso y destructivo como un incendio. Debes vivir la vida sin temer a la muerte, tuya o ajena. Es necesaria para volver al inicio. Ahora que el mundo es completamente nuevo, te regalo también estos dos amuletos para que puedas guardarlos o llevarlos en tu pelo. El silencio es la música. Te amo. I believe that this poem is, is the letter of a father to a daughter. I believe that I am telling, maybe there is something there about my Latin American experience. But it is a letter from a father to a daughter. And it is important, oftentimes, that it is just that. Because my daughter is just a daughter. And she has the right to be a child before she is a Latin American child. In the same way that I have the right to be a man before I am a Latin American man, or I have the right to be a poet before I am a Latin American poet. Being a Latin American poet in the US, to close, is constantly living in the fight of not letting define yourself by your Latin, Ameri by your Latin Americanness. Because it is a trap. That is how you get invitations. That is how you get everywhere. That you must not, we must not run away from the possibility of writing about anything. Because this is not a problem that they have there in our countries. No Mexican poets in Mexico are writing poems about being the conflict of being Mexican. And I don't want necessarily to only write about that. I reserve, I reserve to myself the right that I have to talk about that. But I wanted it to be a right and not an obligation. So a Latin American poet in the US is a poet. And because he's a poet, he has the right to talk about his Latin Americanness or not. Thank you. Of course. And the parents, 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tradition. Yeah, my tradition, my precursors. Yes. When I think <coughs> about um, my precursors in Latin America, here, there are two ways of this answer. One is that those precursors have been changing in different moments of my, of my life as a poet. For example, when I was um, in Mexico, I was surrounded by the idea of Mexican poets. Right? So I was reading a lot of, of, of Jaime Sabines and Octavio Paz and poets of that generation, but also older poets. Then it started changing. <coughs> And poets like, like Cesar Vallejo or Jorge Tellier or reacting because we have, there is also the reaction against, uh, there, there are also poets that you don't identify with and you react to them. For example, I remember that for a, for a, for a very long time when I, was, when I was like 15 or 16, I said many stupid things. But, but the one for which I deserve an award was every time I talked about Borges' poetry. Because me, a 16-year-old in Mexico, was dismissive towards Borges. Right? I used to say loudly, too, that Borges was a great short story writer. He was a great narrator, but a so-so poet. Now, I think that people like Borges is in the center of my poetics, you know. Um, the same happens with, with poets like Wislava Simborska or, or Jose Watanabe. Um, being a Mexican poet, I used to like this very ornamented poetry because Mexican poetry is very formal. And, and, and poets that were working in a, in a simpler way with language like Watanabe or some Eugenio Montejo or the uh, in Mexico, Fabio Morabito, those were like, or, or in the United States, people like Charles Simic, for example. Uh, I, w I was not able to get into that poetry because it, it looked too simple. It, it looked like they were just saying the things. I, I, I needed to mature. I was not ready to read them. I understand that now. So my precursors have changed. My relationship with literature has changed. For example, there was Neruda is a good example for me. When I was very young, I loved Neruda. Then I got a little older, and I hated Neruda. And, and, and now I'm getting older, and I'm going back to Neruda, to a different Neruda. Right? I'm not going back to the Neruda of the, of the love poems, and I'm not going back to the Neruda of the political poems. But there is this surrealist Neruda in the middle that is, is, is an amazing, amazing poet. Um, but I was, but, 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 but I was this young child that was very temperamental with my, with my, uh, with my poets. I either loved them or hated them. And I, and I loved the whole, the, everything that he signed with his name was good or bad, you know. I ha there, there was a moment where I, just like, because I think, this is a healthy thing, uh, with Obro was a very important poem uh, for me. Very, very important poet there. Uh, I think that reading, re well, this, this, this has to happen in Latin America. A Latin American poet that has not been in love of Widobro and Vallejo is, 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 is missing something. This, this, you have to be in that tension with the, with the Latin American avant-garde. Um, but what happened to me is that I, 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 I always felt closer to los poet, de los poemas humanos que de Trilce. And that started changing later, you know. So um, I think that the, the, the question with the precursors has changed. For example, there, there is one experience that I think it has happened to all of us. I read two times Walt Whitman for the first time. When I lived in Mexico, I didn't speak English. So I read Walt Whitman in the translations of Juan Ramón Jiménez and other poets. And I deeply read Walt Whitman. I love, like, I have quotes of Walt Whitman in my poems. And then I came to the United States, and after several years, I was finally able to read Whitman in English. 
And I truly felt that I was reading it for the first time again. So that second Will Whitman, not only because he was in the original language, but because I was an, a, a more experienced reader, told me different things. Shakespeare. I never dreamed of reading Shakespeare in English. And yesterday I was teaching a class on Macbeth. And, and reading Macbeth in English, as difficult as it is for an English speaker, and, and, and being, that's a third language. If I, I speak English, and I am not sure if I speak Shakespeare. Like, I don't. It's, it's very hard, but it's so rich. And I think that those, those experiences have changed me as a poet, even reading other things. I was reading um, um, the dialogues of, of Plato in English because I, I had to teach them. And I love the English translations because in Spanish, he's very proper. Like Socrates sounds like this very proper master, intellectual. But in English, in translations that I have at least, he says things like, okay. You know, like, okay, what is going on? Is it, 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 it's a different Plato. This happens also with the translation of, of Islava Simorska. Um, now, when, 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 an author, when, a, when an author is translating into, for example, Dostoevsky, um, I read Dostoevsky in Spanish and then I read it in English. Neither of them are Russian, so I feel that it's, I'm just choosing whatever I like better. Um, but it's a different feel for the author. So my, my, my influences have changed with me. Um, I think that my arrival to the United States also helped me to be open to Latin America. Um, the presence of Armando Romero, for example, he just gave me, he just gave me readings. Because I was, a, I, yo le digo, I was an expert in Mexican literature, in Mexican poetry, and, and he just let me know how ignorant I was. He, one day he bluntly asked me, so besides Mexican poets, you know anybody else? And I said, Oh, and I said, well, yeah, people like Vallejo and Neruda, and I was like, aha. Uh -huh. and, and, and besides the obvious poets, do you know any? <laughs> you know? Right. So getting to read people like Eugenio Montejo, you know, como leer a los sánsicos, like going to, 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 to the actual literary history of, of our traditions is something that I was only able to do here. Because in order to talk to my friends about the poetry that they know, I will have to get out of the poetry that I know. And that, is, and that is very rich. And that happens here in the United States. It is more common to be in Latin America and to be an expert in your country, in your region, and your generation. You don't have that option here. That was a very long answer. Sorry. I promise to be. Nice. Thank you very much. I will be. Thank you, Mister. I will be. I will be brief. Next time. Um, yeah, I uh, continue in our thoughts on translation. I noticed that I think your first poem about uh, poetic arts uh, came out in the poetry or the lead. She. Of course. Yes, and, and this is something that has been pointed out several times. Well, and I also have to say that uh, you, I, I don't hear you mentioning very many female poets mm -hmm. in your discussions and people that you've read, etc. And uh, I wondered, at, at the, isn't there a bit of an irony there in uh, this kind of juxtaposition? But anyway, tell me what your thoughts yes. were. Well, with the leaf. First, uh, when I was translating that poem, first the she happened uh, without my conscious. It just happened when I was translating. And, and of course, when revising, I decided to keep it there because it gives 
the leaf, it personifies the leaf. I was thinking in the leaf as a, not as a thing. It, 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 it is, I also call about its tragedy, you know, and its persistence. Like it is alive and it's fighting. So um, using, using the she um, seemed to me the right call to, to personify that struggle. You know. um, you're right, I haven't mentioned many female writers. Um, but they are there. Um, I did mention Bislava Simorska, the Polish poet, um, which is in the center. I think, I think that is uh, one of the most important poets of, of this century and past. Um, uh, <coughs> being a Mexican poet, it is impossible to ignore that uh, Mexican poetry had a, a mother, not a father. Um, Sor Juana is there, and is the beginning of all of our literature. Um, here, I have translated the, the current poet laureate of the United States, uh, Joy Harjo. Um, a few years ago, I worked on translations of her poems because um, when I read her, I was in New Mexico when someone gave her to me. And it, it, it is a kind of poetry that reminded me a lot to the Mayan poets in the Yucatan, um, particularly to one called Briseida Cuevas. Um, she's a poet from Calquini in Campeche. And she, she writes in Mayan language, and then she translates herself into Spanish. And we're, we're, we're close friends. But her, the poetry of, of Briseida and the poetry of Joy Harjo are connected by, by, by one way that, that I can only find, not only in the fact that they are both female poems, but they are both indigenous poets. And, and, and their poetry has this connection to earth and, and this, this, this cosmo vision. And well, I also believe that our literary influences are not only literary. They're not only books. And the, the great poet of my family is my grandmother, um, which has never written a book. But she is the, the, the word player in the house um, since I was little. You will ask something, and she will reply to that something. But she will reply. She will find a way to rhyme. And it was fun. It is very fun. Um, I think that there are also other poets, for example, um, when thinking of the works of Pablo Neruda, we have to be aware that he is impossible without Gabriela Mistral. Um, she was the one that made him read the Russians. Um, she, a lot of what he is, is thanks to her. And when we read her right now, um, we understand that she was like Rosario Castellanos in Mexico. She was, I think that we were not ready to read the full extent and, and depth of her work. Um, so yes, they are there. They are there. They are there. Any other questions? American Dirt. Mm -hmm. Well, 
this is it, it, it is incredibly difficult to see in the midst of everything that is happening um, what is what what is going on I think for example well, well two things um, how well I'm gonna try to answer the three parts of your question so what do I say about the story of the of the migrants I did write a book um, that might be published soon about that, that is written in the voice of, of a kid uh, whose dad was deported. And this is, and, I'm, I'm only, and I only wanted to write this, and it's a, it's a children's book, because that was the case of seven or eight of my students in different years. Um, students that suddenly became quiet. And, and then I learned that the experience of deportation of a family member is mourned in the family as, as, as a death. It's highly traumatic, it's terrible. One of these parents just presented himself to be deported two days ago, you know. And there was a, an ICE raid in Cincinnati two weeks ago. Um, immigration surrounded a construction site and 70% of the contractors were Guatemalan. And I, I knew when I read this in the news, I read it on a Saturday, I knew that one of my students at least was going to be related with this. I teach in a school that is for underprivileged kids. So most of my kids are uh, black or Hispanic. <coughs> And from the Hispanic kids, most of them are from um, illegal immigrant parents. But it is very hard for me to write this. Because somehow I feel, I mean, I do feel that that story does not belong to me. What I do is that I, I hold poetry workshops where my students tell that story because it's theirs. And I, I believe that that is more honest, to help them tell their story. I don't like the idea of speaking for someone else. And I don't think that I have the ability to, 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 to write that book also. And it just doesn't belong to me. If I did that, it would be not because I have a poetic desire, but because I have a stardom desire. And that is not. If I, if I wanted to be a star, I will do something else, not poetry. This is not the most startup thing to do. Then, um, what was the second part? What do I do? Oh, with the Book of American Dirt. I have not read the book, but I'm reading everything about the book. I, that is exactly the problem. Someone, who has no idea of the story, wrote the story. Like, I, I am an immigrant, and I am Mexican descent, and I am bilingual, and I still don't feel that I can tell the story of my students. Like, I know that if I would do it, people would have more, more problems questioning me. And I still think it's unethical to do it. You know? Do I think it's impossible to do? I don't know. I think that the, the worst problem of, of American dirt, the literary problem is not telling a story that does not belong to you, it's telling a story that is not necessarily true. It's making this, this book where where you can only be, if you are Mexican, you can only be a murderer or a victim. So people can only have either pity or fear of you. So if you're gonna tell someone else's story, at least try to tell a complex one, not this really simple story. Because many other writers have written from the perspective of people that they are not. That's what literature is about. It's called fiction. 
So I do believe in fiction. And as an author, everybody has the right to make their own fiction. But having the right does not exempt you of the responsibilities. And that is an irresponsible book. In these political moments, writing that kind of book, portraying that people in that way, is irresponsible and violent. So I think that the problem of the book is not only talking about something that it does not belong to you, it's just being a bad book. And being a book that could be violent in this, or, 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 or justify violence in this political environment. We have literature from the perspective of the other has been written from the beginning of that. And, and it has been dangerous from the beginning of that. It's, it's not something that I am. Yesterday I read a, a, a column in the, in the New Yorker that was satirical. And it was this guy that said, me, as a 22 Mexican author, cannot understand why my novel about being a 45-year-old white woman is not being accepted. You know? And he, he, he tells, well, I, I, I watched this on Netflix, so I think that if I know enough about Desperate Housewives, I can write this novel. And, and he's making that case. And it sounds ridiculous, but it sounds ridiculous from that way there. But in the, but in the other way, it's, it is just an appropriation, and, and it's maybe fine. So it's, it, we have to be really careful with those things. I, I, I believe also that right now, when someone chooses to talk about the other, it must be only to humanize them and to make them equal, not to make them different. That, that, is, that is precisely the center of my talk. It is before they are Mexican, they're humans. You know, and if we don't put human before anything else, we're doing a disservice to humanity itself. And I do believe right now that the big call of the artist should be just call humanity into every human being. We need, we need to go back to, to just humanity. Um, we are celebrating right now 100 years of the avant-garde. In the 1920s was the big European and Latin American avant-garde. And the avant-garde artists were about estridence and noise and uh, abolishing the status quo and abolishing the notion of truth. But right now, I think that all of that is abolished. <laughs> you know, we cannot really understand what truth is anymore. We, we are in, a, in, in an era of alternative facts and fake news. And the poets, I think, that have a diff 100 years later have a different job. Now it's not about exploding the notion of true and good and bad. It's about slowing down and helping people to contemplate. It is important. I think that if that was an avant-garde of noise, this has to be an avant-garde of silence. Because that's what we, that's what we need. There is noise already. The, 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 the reality is already broken. We don't need to break it. It's already broken. Bueno, chicos, um, thank you, thank you, Manuel, thank you very much for, for being here. So, tenemos un aplauso importante.